One of the things that you see in the Gospels is that Jesus is challenged on his authority. And it's one of those things that you can very easily read past if you don't know what's going on. And that's going to be the subject matter for this episode of the teaching series, Rabbis and Disciples, Part 5. And hey, if you're watching this on YouTube and you find this to be helpful, like this video, subscribe to our channel, and share this teaching with someone you think could benefit. All right, let's dive into our episode and see what we can find. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode addressing Jesus' authority. We've referenced this multiple times in this mini-series of Rabbis and Disciples, and now we get to get into this facet of the rabbinical world that's going to help you to better understand some of the stories connected to Jesus in the Gospels. And so let's just jump right in at the synagogue in Capernaum. And the synagogue that Jesus would have been teaching in in Mark chapter 1 is probably right underneath this one. But Jesus, no less, is teaching in a synagogue. He's been baptized. He's gone into the desert. His ministry has begun. And it's in Mark 1 that Mark introduces us to this issue of authority that's going to play itself out in Jesus' adult ministry. And so Jesus is in the synagogue. He is teaching. And notice what the crowd's response is. Mark 1, verse 22. It says, And they were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, this word authority here, originally recorded, or what we have from the Gospel of Mark, is in Greek, and it's the word exousia. And if you just did a search of exousia in the Gospels, you will see that it fairly shows up, or shows up fairly regularly, uh, across all four Gospels. And particularly, this word exousia carries this idea of power, control, or authority. But based on its context will help you to understand what facet of power, control, or authority is being exerted. Because exousia really comes in two veins, if you will, in the Gospels. You have authority due to one's ruling position. So the Roman centurion has authority. He's got exousia. But there's another form of authority, and that is due to one's ordination. This is rabbinic ordination, and this is the authority that the people seem to be addressing in the synagogue in Capernaum. Now, I want to help you to understand what was this rabbinic ordination or authority all about. And I'm going to be drawing upon the research of a guy by the name of David Dowby. He wrote this book, The New Testament and Rabbinic Judaism, in 1956. It is still a seminal work in understanding rabbinics in connection to Jesus and the New Testament. Uh, more current research is of another David, a guy by the name of David Stern. He's got this fantastic Jewish New Testament commentary, and they're both talking about the same thing. So these are going to be the two primary sources that I'm drawing from for the research that I'm going to be presenting to you in the rest of this episode. So rabbinic ordination, what do we know? What happened? Why are they asking Jesus or at least marveling at one who has this authority? Well, a couple words you need to know. The first is smicha, and it means ordination. The second word I want you to know in the Hebrew is reshut, and it means authority. So exousia is the Greek, but behind that, the Hebrew word for authority is the word reshut. And the idea of smicha actually comes from the word samak, which means to lean upon. So literally, smicha means a leaning upon, or we say it's the ordination. So if someone is going to be ordained, it's essentially a smicha ceremony where one person who has reshut, authority, leans their hands upon that individual, conferring authority from one to another. And so David Stern says that there had to be three people part of this and one had to have reshut, the other David does not say that there had to be three people. He just says a person with reshut can confer it on to another. So the, the baseline understanding there is that you couldn't have an ordination. You couldn't receive 
authority in, uh, outside of someone who was giving it to you who already had authority. And there's a whole tradition connected to this. And if you want to read more about that, read David Dalby's chapter on that. That will help fill in a, a number of gaps there. So if you are a rabbi who has had a smicha ceremony, an ordination, then you now have authority. And rabbis with reshut could do things that the common rabbi could not do. So the three primary things that distinguished you as a rabbi with reshut is that one, you could pass legal judgments. Two, you could introduce new interpretations or doctrines. Three, you could raise up disciples to follow you. So when I say that a rabbi with reshut is different than just a common rabbi, common rabbis were also scribes. And scribes weren't just people who copied down, you know, on the manuscripts, books of the Bible. They were also teachers of the Torah. And as we explored in our very first episode, if you were a teacher of the Torah, you were called rabbi. It was a term of respect for someone who taught the Torah. But if you are a rabbi with reshut, these are what you were able to do that the common rabbis were not able to do. Now, the common rabbis were the ones who seemed to be doing the elementary school, the middle school, and we talked about Beit Sefer, Beit Midrash, Beit Talmud, all of that. But they are not having disciples that are following them because that is an itinerant rabbinic lifestyle, which appears to be only part of the lifestyle of rabbis with Reshut. And so when I say disciples that will follow them, meaning they're going to be itinerant, they're going to be walking around the country, the hillsides, teaching in synagogues, and we're going to talk about that in our next episode. But this is something that is unique to a rabbi with Reshut. And if all of this is correct, and again, this is just pulling from so many different resources and whatnot, David Biven estimates that in Jesus' day, there were somewhere between 35 and 60 rabbis with Reshut. And so if David is correct, everybody knows the rabbis who have Reshut. And so one of the things that we have been identifying in becoming a Talmud, becoming a disciple, is that you would pursue a rabbi to study under, but that rabbi was someone with authority. So this connects what we have talked about in earlier episodes. What's more is we said you focus on the rabbi's yoke, their interpretation. So when they're offering up new interpretations of the text, that is part of that rabbi's yoke. And again, a rabbi with reshut had a yoke, which means their interpretations of the text that they have introduced in to society. The common rabbis, which were still amazing people, could only teach what was commonly accepted by the larger community. They couldn't introduce new doctrines in to the conversation, but rabbis with reshut could. And that's why when we laid out this analogy of if you made your middle school basketball team, it was like getting into Beit Sefer, and we moved all the way down. We said getting, becoming a rabbi was like becoming an all-star in the NBA, and becoming a rabbi with authority is like getting into the Hall of Fame. Only a select few eventually reached that kind of level, and you were considered to be a rabbi with Reshut, a rabbi with authority. And this is why that they're all amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribe. So you can see that comparison being drawn out here in the synagogue in Capernaum with the response of the audience. Now, Jesus is going to now heal a man with an unclean spirit. And so now just five verses later, we read, and they were all amazed. So they debated among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority? Of course, new teachings could only happen with authority. And so we see this being linked here in Mark 1, 27. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. So that's how Mark gets the conversation going. This is like the best passage for a foundational understanding of the contrast and what is going on in the text. Now, in Matthew's version or Matthew's gospel, not version of this story, but in Matthew's gospel, he introduces Jesus's authority on the lips of the audience after the Sermon on the Mount. So in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus is doing his teachings, what we call the Sermon on the Mount here. 
And then at the end, it says this, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. So there we go. We've got the authority and not as their scribes. This is where Matthew is introducing it. And that's helpful for us because the next story I want to look at is in Matthew chapter 21. It's in Jesus's last week. He is up on the temple mount. He is teaching somewhere around the temple and Jesus is going to be questioned. Notice what is going on here. Matthew 21 verse 23. And when Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? So they are not happy with what Jesus is doing. And it's not only his teaching, because a rabbi was not just in word, but a rabbi did things in word and deed. Jesus has cleansed the temple. And so they're going, what in the world? By, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? I.e., who laid their hands upon you? Who participated in your smicha ceremony? Because we want to have a conversation with them because why in the world they would ordain you, we don't understand. So that's where the tension is coming from. Notice Jesus's brilliant rabbinic response because he has been asked a question and Jesus in good rabbinic fashion is going to respond with his own question. So it says, Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come from? From heaven, which is a euphemism for God, i.e. from God, or from man. So there was apparently some kind of discussion about where G John had gotten his authority from, or at least Jesus is positing this dilemma. And so we read on, it says, and they discussed it among themselves saying, well, if we say from heaven, i.e. from God, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? Right? Because John was the one who was preparing the way for Jesus. And Jesus is like, if you didn't believe in him, of course, you're not going to believe in me. But if you believed in him and that, that was from God, then why are you questioning me on my authority? And so if we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why did you not believe in him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd for they all hold that John was a prophet, i.e. commissioned by God to do what he needed to do. And so if we say, well, he's from man, then people are going to go, but wait a minute, he is a prophet. So John functions like a rabbi. John is also a prophet, Jesus as well. And so there's a lot going on here in both rabbi and prophet, and we're not going to be able to get into all of that, but you can see what the dilemma is. And so then it says, and then they answer Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And he silences them. Now, what's interesting, and we've explored this in the past, is that when you wanted to have a conversation and you wanted to continue the conversation, if somebody asked you a question, you would respond with a question to keep the conversation going. But in many cases, your question back, the answer to the previous question is part of your question back to the initial questioner. And so when Jesus says, okay, you're asking me about my authority. Let me ask you about John. Where did his baptism come from? Was it from heaven or from man? I actually think Jesus is making a veiled reference to what answer they're looking for, which is that Jesus's smicha ceremony, where he received his authority, was actually at his baptism. Remember, John is baptizing by the Jordan. Jesus comes down to him. God speaks and confirms Jesus's identity and John is there. I think both God the Father, the Holy Spirit, because it's the Spirit is descending like a dove, and John the Baptist is there. And I think this is Jesus's smicha ceremony where he is being given his authority to go forth. Because prior to this, Jesus doesn't do anything fantastic. He, got, he has to get the Spirit first and he gets it at the baptism and then he goes forth in authority to then do his ministry. And so this is also another conversation for another. The text is so deep, isn't it? I mean, it's just so much there. 
But the last story I want to look at that kind of pulls together where Matthew goes with all of this authority, because he introduces it at the Sermon on the Mount. You get Jesus being questioned about it here. And then there's another significant story at the end of Matthew. And that takes place in Matthew 28. We call it the Great Commission. And it takes place up in the Galilee. I think it takes place at Mount Arbel. Again, another conversation would be needed to put all those pieces together. But let me just show you where Mount Arbel is. So this is from the Sea of Galilee, an aerial shot looking west. And you can see this is all part of Mount Arbel. But this very tip here, if we kind of swing around from the west and look east and kind of look a little bit kind of northeast, you can see here, these are actually little people. That, well, they're people. They're not little, but they look little. And it's this big, big mountain that looks onto the rest of the Galilee region. And it was here where Jesus did approximately 90% of his ministry. It's all in eye shot of the tip of Mount Arbel. And it is here where Jesus brings his disciples. In fact, the text tells us that they go to the mountain that Jesus had told them to go. It doesn't tell us it was Mount Arbel. There's lots of connections that seems to imply this is probably the best suggestion. But let's look at the text, a very well-known text, but hear it anew. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So Jesus is now saying, listen, I have all of this authority. And immediately the disciples would have understood, okay, this is all the rabbinic authority. But Jesus is now saying, yes, rabbinic authority to do everything that I did. But even beyond that, because he has just risen from the dead and he has met his disciples in the galley. They are still wrestling. In fact, this passage begins with some of the disciples are still doubting. They're trying to figure out what in the world just happened. Nobody saw the resurrection coming like it did. And so Jesus says, listen, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Well, who is able to make disciples? A rabbi can make disciples. And one of the things that we have shown is that in becoming a Talmud and becoming a disciple is that you're with a rabbi and if you are among the best of the best, right? You made it in the NBA, but if you made it to the All-Stars and you became a rabbi and then eventually a rabbi with Ray Shute, well then at the age of 30, you could become a rabbi. And Jesus is saying to them, listen, I want you to go and make disciples. I think this is the disciples' smicha ceremony. They've only been with Jesus for three, three and a half years, depending upon how you reckon it from the text. And typically, if you became a disciple of a rabbi at the age of 15, you would be with that rabbi for a number of years. And if you grew in your wisdom and knowledge and you became a rabbi, it was roughly the age of 30. Some of these guys are still in their teenage years. And Jesus goes, yep, I am now granting you my authority. It's a huge moment. And he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. It's like Jesus goes, I gave you my yoke. Now, I want you to take my yoke, what I have taught you, what I have trained you to do, and you do that with others. And he says, go and make disciples. And we've made this observation before Jesus' point isn't go and make converts. He says go and make disciples. Making disciples subsumes conversion, but oftentimes in the church, we stop at conversion. We think conversion is the point. For Jesus, the conversion is not the point. It is towards the point. Or we could say this, and I've said this before, salvation is never the end game. It's the beginning. Discipleship is what Jesus is after. When you come into relationship with Jesus, it launches you as a disciple on this track of being like Jesus, learning from Jesus, studying what he said, emulating how he responded in social situations. It is all wrapped up in this discipleship process. And Jesus wants them to understand the importance of discipleship, that that's what he was about. And how significant was this for Jesus to communicate this to his disciples? Friends, they had to walk a hundred miles from Jerusalem up to the Galilee to have this conversation with Jesus. Jesus dies and and died and rose again in Jerusalem. He will ascend from the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. And yet he tells his disciples, meet me in the Galilee. Why? 
because this was the training ground. This is where Jesus trained them to walk as he walked. And if you look at the gospel stories, two stories happen in the Galilee after the resurrection. The reinstatement of Peter down here on the shores of the Sea of Galilee and this story, I believe on top of Mount Arbel, happens. And it's like Jesus has them walk 200 miles to embed into their feet and their head and their heart that he came for discipleship. It just it's so interesting to me. Jesus could have gone to Rome. He could have converted the emperor. He could have done some party tricks and said, hey, make sure everybody knows who I am and mandate it for the entire empire. He doesn't. He snags a group of people and he pours into them. He trains them. He gives them their yoke. He teaches them what it looks like to walk as he walks. And then he brings them to a significant moment. He says, therefore go and do likewise. And as we noted in our last episode, he reminds them at the end, listen, I am with you in this. That that's what Matthew is trying to communicate, that in chapter 1, Jesus will be with us. God will be with us. And Jesus' last words in Matthew 28, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age, and wedged in between here is this idea of discipleship. It is so incredibly important for Jesus that he goes around with the authority of God to teach, to train, to do all of this. People are questioning him. How'd you get this? Who gave this to you? Why are you doing what you're doing? And Jesus goes, this is my way of communicating in flesh and blood, in word and deed. This is what God's will and way looks like here on earth. And he says to his disciples, it's your turn now. You are now called to do the same. Friends, as we are part of following Jesus, part of being a disciple is also helping other people understand the way of Jesus, to understand the scriptures and to faithfully walk it out in life. And if we are missing that, we are missing what Jesus was doing in the gospel stories with these disciples. So friends, there you go. There is part five of Rabbis and Disciples. I'm looking forward to the next episode as we dig into the specifics of what Jesus's life looked like and how do you make a living and what does it look like to have an occupation and what happens if you can't work and how do people provide for you and all of those other things that everybody knew in the first century world, but we need to understand as well to better understand the life of Jesus and what it meant for the rabbi and his disciples. So friends, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for listening, and may you walk out the text well in your life.